Hey, welcome back to Principles of Mathematics. Or is this critical thinking? Sometimes I forget because I know last time we talked about mathematical certainty and I believe I promised you that this time we would take a look at a priori probability, which will involve some mathematics. I'm not a math teacher, this is not a math course, but we're going to need to do some calculations here. So why don't you grab a pencil, some scratch paper, and maybe even a calculator, and let's get started. Now in our last session, we took a look at kinds of certainty, and now we get to do the same thing for probability. When it comes to induction, since only perfect inductions can result in certainty, and those are rare, we're normally left in the realm of probability. And probability, we've said, refers to the likelihood that something is the case or is true. And this always comes in degrees. Unlike our discussion of certainty, here we only have two types or kinds of probability. We've got a priori probability and a posteriori probability. So what are these and what's the difference? A priori probability, from the Latin for from the former, or what comes beforehand, prior, is purely mathematical. It's independent of events or experience. It's logical and it's statistical. A posteriori, on the other hand, which is from the Latin for from the later or what comes afterward, post, is empirical. It's mathematical. Calculations like measurements, etc., are based on empirical observation and follow empirical observation. It's also dependent, therefore, on events. It's scientific and it's experimental. And I'll give an example of each to show the difference. So for a priori probability, maybe figuring the probability of winning the lottery. Where for a posteriori probability, say figuring the probability that a 20-year-old man is going to live to the age of 75. The first we could figure without ever running the lottery, and the second has to follow the accumulation of lots of observational data. In this video, we're going to focus on a priori probability almost exclusively. And this kind, as we said, is purely mathematical. It has to do with working out odds and possible combinations and things like that. Degrees of probability that we can know by mathematical means alone. Computations that can be made independently of any empirical observation of actual events. One question you might have in light of our previous discussion is, since it has to do with mathematics, can't we have mathematical certainty? Why aren't we talking about certainty rather than probability? Well, we can have mathematical certainty about the calculations regarding probability. We can know the exact probability. But these are still calculations regarding the chance that something will be the case. And whether something actually occurs is influenced by factors beyond the math. Numbers don't actually possess any causal power themselves. So let's look at some different scenarios and the types of calculations we can do to give you a better idea of what we're talking about exactly. Now, this is not a math course, so I'm going to keep things as basic as possible. And let's start with how you can figure the a priori probability of an exclusive event, meaning an event taken by itself, not in combination with or dependent upon any other event. The formula is very simple. We take the number of events that satisfy our criteria, we'll call that the target events, T, divided by the number of possible outcomes, P, and we get a formula that looks basically like this. The probability of A is equal to T divided by P. For example, what's the probability of coming up heads on a coin toss? Only one side satisfies the criteria, the target event, heads, but there are two possible outcomes. You have heads and tails. So the probability or the chance of any single outcome is going to be one out of two, half or 50 percent. Let's look at a few more example scenarios. What are the chances of rolling a six on a six-sided die? Well, there is one target event, six. There are six possible outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And therefore the probability is going to be one out of six or one-sixth. Now, what's the probability of drawing a particular card from a standard deck? Again, it's one target event. There are going to be 52 possible outcomes. A standard card deck has 52 cards. So the probability is going to be 1 out of 52. Pretty straightforward. OK, how do we deal with independent events? Wait, isn't that the same thing we were just looking at? No, those were exclusive or singular events. 
Independent refers to multiple events where each event occurs independently of the others. In other words, one event has no effect on the other. The formula is a bit more complicated, but not too bad. Take the basic rule for calculating exclusive events, the number of target events divided by the number of possible events, figure the odds for each event on its own, and then we're going to multiply the odds of each event together. So we're going to have what's called the restricted conjunction rule, which is this. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Here's a scenario. Flipping two coins, what's the probability of both coming up heads? Well, the probability of each coin coming up heads is one half. So we're going to multiply one half times one half, and it gives us a quarter or one in four chance. What about the probability of getting one heads and one tails? Well, two out of the four possible combinations are actually identical. You've got both heads, both tails, or one heads, one tails, or the other way around, one heads, one tails. Since it doesn't matter what the first coin flip gives us, we can consider it a two out of two shot of getting what we need. So everything actually comes down to the second flip. So it's going to look a little bit more like this. Two out of two shot on the first flip, one out of two shot on the second flip, so we end up with a two out of four shot, or one out of two, chances are 50%. Now let's try rolling two die. What's the probability of getting two sixes? Well, on our first roll, we've got one out of six chance. On our second roll, we've got one out of six chance, so it's going to be one out of 36 chance. What about one six and one four? Well, we have two target events that would satisfy our criteria for the first roll. I can get a six or a four, and then everything comes down again to the second roll. This is a lot like the coin flip that we just did. So we end up with a two out of 36 chance, or one in 18. Now, let's return to the cards. What's the probability of drawing two aces from the deck? And be careful. These are not independent events. Drawing the second ace actually has a higher probability than drawing the first because we've modified the deck. The number of possible outcomes is reduced and it requires a different calculation. So let's take a look at what that would involve. Figuring probability for dependent events, which is referring to more than one event where each is connected to and influences another. Here, we have to use a rule to compute probability that works whether or not the events are independent. It's the general conjunction rule. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. That's what the B line A signifies. Or we could say the probability of B being true or occurring if A is true or has occurred. It's slightly more complicated than the restricted conjunction rule, but it can be used in place of that rule for independent events, and here's why. If events A and B are independent, the probability of B given A would be the same as the probability of B on its own, since A is irrelevant to the likelihood of B. So let's look at that card deck again. What's the probability of drawing two aces from a standard deck when the first card's not put back? Well, the probability of A is 4 out of 52, because there are four aces in a standard deck. The probability of B given A would be 3 out of 51. If we don't draw the ace on the first draw, we're done. If we do draw an ace, now we have one less ace, and one less card overall. Instead of 52, we have 51. So the probability of A and B would be 4 out of 52 times 3 out of 51, which would give us the odds of ultimately 1 in 221 chance. What about dependent events involving combinations? Here we're talking permutations, or the number of possible combinations of items in a given set. The simple permutation formula can be used. To figure out how many combinations there are for a given number of known items or events, this would be n factorial where n is the number of items. We multiply the number of items n by n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3, and on we go until we reach 1. Or put another way, we can multiply every whole number between 1 and n together, and that's going to give us the total number of possible combinations. So let's walk through a few examples. How do we figure the number of possible combinations of any three letters? Let's say A, B, C. 
n is 3, so it would be dealing with 3 factorial, or 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. That would come out ABC, ACB, BAC, BCA, CAB, CBA, and we've exhausted all of the possible combinations with those 6. Now, how many different arrangements can there be, let's say, when we place 5 people in 5 chairs? Well, seat 1 could be occupied by any of the 5. Seat 2 could be occupied by any of the 4 remaining after seat 1 is filled. Seat 3 could be occupied by any of the 3 remaining after seats 1 and 2 are filled, and so on. So we're dealing with 5 factorial, or 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Here we have 120 combinations possible. Or we could throw in a 10-digit alarm code on a 10-digit keypad, where each number can only be used one time. That would be 10 factorial, which would come out with 3,628,800 combinations possible. Of course, that's how it would work if we were interested in all the members of a set. But what do we do when the number is limited to a subset of all possible combinations of a given number of items? Say, how many combinations are there for a three-digit alarm code on a 10-digit keypad? Again, where each number can be used only once. Well, we can't simply calculate the factorial. We need a modified rule. The rule would look like this. You have n factorial divided by n minus r factorial, where r is the number of items we're looking for. In this case, we're starting with 10 factorial divided by 10 minus 3, because we're interested in only three numbers out of 10, or simplified 10 factorial divided by 7 factorial, which is 10 times 9 times 8 all the way down to 1, divided by 7 times 6 all the way down to 1, and 7 factorial in the numerator and denominator ultimately cancel each other out. So we end up with 10 times 9 times 8, or 720 combinations. Or more simply, we multiply n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 until we've satisfied our criteria. But how often do we find alarm codes, PIN numbers, passwords, etc., that restrict the number of times you can use a particular letter or number? Almost never. So we're going to need a complex permutation formula for situations where items in a set may be used multiple times. Here, we take the number of options for each position, and we raise it to the power of the number of positions. What's the number of possible three-letter combinations of any three letters A, B, C, where each letter can be used multiple times? Well, we've got three options for each position in the combination. We also have three positions. So instead of six possible combinations, we end up with 27 using the same three letters, because we have three cubed, which is 27 right? A, 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 B, and on we go until we've got 27 combinations. And if you haven't realized it yet, figuring the probability of picking the correct three-letter combination brings us back to where we started with essentially the same formula we used for our dice roll. For each position, there is one target letter, but three possible options, which is one out of three or one-third. And then there's three positions. So we're multiplying one-third times one-third times one-third, and we have one and 27 odds of guessing correctly what the right combination is. Two more examples. How about a 10-digit alarm code on a 10-digit keypad where each number can be used multiple times? Well, there are 10 possible options for each of the 10 positions. So we're talking 10 to the 10th power, or 10 times 10 all the way down which is going to give us 10 billion possible codes. Imagine how difficult that is to guess. And lastly, what about a safe? Say with three 15-number dials. You've got 15 options for each of the three positions. So you have 15 cubed, or 15 times 15 times 15, which leaves us with 3,375 possible combinations on that safe. Even though our focus in this video has been on a priori probability, I want to wrap up by returning to a posteriori probability briefly for contrast. Notice that we've been able to calculate probability exactly, or with mathematical certainty, before rolling dice, drawing cards, or punching in alarm codes. A posteriori probability 
can't be calculated until after events and observations, which is why this kind of probability is identified with scientific method, which provides logical guidelines for solving inductive problems, formulating hypotheses, and determining if a hypothesis should be accepted or rejected. Numerical calculations, when possible, follow observation. And we often have to guess at how probable our conclusions are. And we're going to deal with scientific method beginning in our next video. But for now, to get a sense of what we mean by a posteriori calculation, think back to our discussion on another episode where we dealt with presidential approval polls. A perfect example, I think, of something that we can't estimate a priori. We have to actually take the poll. Another example of a mathematical calculation that must be a posteriori would be calculating an average. Before an average can be calculated, data has to be collected from observation and from testing. For example, if we want to know a student's GPA, we need to first have grades. So what's the grade point average of a student whose test scores are as follows? On test 1, he got a 90%, test 2, 65%, test 3, 74%, test 4, 88%. We generally get the average by adding the individual scores together and then dividing by the number of scores. Here we get 79.25% which is almost a B. Now the reason I say we generally get the average this way is because average is a bit ambiguous. What do we mean when we say average? Statistical results depend on the type of average selected and selection is a product of human choice something we're going to explore when we discuss philosophy of science down the road. So when we evaluate arguments and inferences involving averages, it's essential to know in what sense the word is being used. And there are three different types of averages. We've got the mean, the arithmetical average, which we employed a moment ago, found by dividing the sum of the individual values by the number of the data in the set. The median, which is the middle point, when the data is arranged in ascending order. And third, the mode, or the value that occurs with the greatest frequency in a data set. The type of average selected can make a huge difference in an argument, since averages can actually vary pretty widely. So let's take a look at this scenario. Let's try to figure out the average salary of a small architectural company. If we take the mean, we get $65,000 per year. If we take the median, we get $45,000 per year. And if we take the mode, we only get $30,000 per year, where almost 50% of the employees fall. Just imagine the implications of basing policy on an argument from an a posteriori calculation regarding average, whether of household income, tax rates, life expectancy, annual global temperatures, etc. So as a word of warning, we can't evaluate information and arguments critically if they're presented with imprecise terms or if we aren't aware of distinctions that need to be drawn. And we've seen problems with vagueness and ambiguity numerous times in the past. I think that's a good place to stop today. I think we've done enough math. We've done enough calculations. You could put away your calculators. We're not going to use those again going forward. Next time, since we're already talking about a posteriori probability, we're going to be moving on to scientific method. So until then, Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.